All right, Job chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Imagine being Job in that moment. Because Job was saying, oh, I was righteous. I've done right. I've not sinned. I haven't done any wrong. And his friends were saying, you have sinned secret sin. And though we can't see it, God found you out. And that's why these tragedies came upon your family and came upon all those around you and came upon uh, all your livestock. And he's lost everything. And the man's standing there. He's, he's been covered with boils and he's been sick in his body. Every sign of sin is upon this man. Yeah. And these guys who were old... Older men were saying, you can't hide your sins. They found you out. And so Job started to justify himself by saying, I didn't sin. I didn't do anything wrong. I trusted in the Lord. It is not I. I don't know why he has done this to me. All right, so I just want you to know this about Job. This is the simple thing you got to know about Job. He wasn't lying about his condition. The problem was, He didn't justify God rather than himself. This is where the problem was. He should have said, look, I have not sinned, but I tell you what, I know God is righteous, and no matter what has come upon me, it is not because of any wicked or foul thing in him. But rather, he says, I don't know why he's done this to me, like God's at fault. So this is God now saying, shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered to the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. (laughs) Yeah, ha, ha. (laughs) Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may justify yourself? I hear people say it all the time. All the time. You say, Job, what was wrong with him? People do it all the time. I don't know why God took his life. I don't know why this happened to us. I don't know why God did this. It's the same thing Job said. You ought to say, I don't know why it happened, but God is righteous no matter what I face. I always say it must be me because he can do no evil. Sometimes it hurts to say those words, but I will not speak against God. Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like his? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. (laughs) These gods talk about his attributes. So I would suggest you read that list and get out of it. Don't be in that list. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Look now at Behemoth. This is the the Bible's talking about dinosaurs. Christians ought to stop saying there was no dinosaurs. It's so stupid. This is one of them. Behemoth, a large land animal, which was so amazing, with, made a, along with you to eat grass like an ox. See how his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar and sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are bars of iron. He is first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the locust trees in the in the coverts of the reeds of the marsh, and the lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth. Though he takes it in, um, in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. 
Can you draw out Leviathan? Now here is a great sea creature called Leviathan. This is another dinosaur in the sea. With a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower. Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will, uh, will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Uh, will you take him as a servant forever? You know, he's going on and on, and he finally goes on to say in verse 11, who has preceded me that I should pay him everything under heaven is mine. So it's almost like he took the mighty things of the earth at that time, and he says, these are my servants, and you can't even get near them with a sword. Right. And you're questioning me? I mean, I love his attitude. Sounds a little British to me, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, you know, God is like us, and we are like him in this. He's amazed by haughtiness. Yeah. It's amazing to him. Yeah. Okay, can you turn now to Psalm chapter 1? So I think that man, it's just two, a page to the right, two pages to the right. Um, Psalm chapter 1, it's amazing how God speaks to these things. It says, the very first psalm, the very first verse, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Right. Ungodliness will cause you to think you have the right to be above God or to question him. He says in the New Testament, will the thing created say to he who created it, why have you made? You know, I even believe this. When you're low and depressed and you feel like you're a sack of potatoes and you aren't worth much, you feel like you're something skin in a bag and you're worthless, you are boasting against the Creator's creation. You should never speak against yourself. You understand? When we open our mouth against ourselves, we open our mouth against him. It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Let not your mouth speak against yourself. Uh -huh. mm. Mm. Somebody, somebody, come on, today's the day to get rid of that false humility. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law of the Lord. What I think is amazing, there are many people who try to define for God what's right and wrong. I, I, just, I just swallow sometimes. Because there's sometimes he, he says things and does things that I'm sitting there going like, well, I wouldn't do that. But who am I? To question him. He knows more than me. But he delights, this is the man, for his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law, he meditates day and night. We should study God's principles so that we don't believe our own. He shall be like a tree. This is what happens if you do this. You shall be like a tree planted by the river of waters that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So a lot of people say the gospel is not about prosperity. They are 1,000% wrong. God promises all through the Bible, old and new, prosperity to those who will walk in his ways. It does not mean there aren't going to be some valleys or ditches along the way. It just means you will prosper. You will succeed in all your doings. Now, if you can uh, just go to Psalms chapter 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 1. So I, I just wanted you, wanted you to see about the questions of man, uh, I think, society, nations, everything. There's questioning that goes on, and God has answers for everything, but humility before God is the way, and there shall be no other way. It says in verse 1 of chapter 2 of the Psalms, why do the nations rage? All right, there's the question. And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, meaning Christ, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. 
He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yes, I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. And I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. We sung about that song today. Well, that was awesome, you guys. I enjoyed those songs so much. Thank you to the worship team. <coughs> you are my son. <coughs> today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the very nations that rage against me. Uh huh. Come on, you are offspring of God. You are children through Jesus Christ. Therefore, when you ask, Jesus said, For I have asked the Father for you, but the day is coming. You will ask him directly yourself, for he loves you also, he said to his disciples. And he will do whatever you ask of him in my name. So in the name of Jesus, we are to be asking for the things that he has purchased and won. We are to believe, be believing for all the healings, for the nations to come to God, for all the people who are in darkness to be brought out of darkness, for the wisdom of truth to prevail in our day. I want you to know the word son in the Hebrew language means builder of the family name. You are my son. You are the builder of the family name. Isn't that awesome? Jesus was born to build the family name. You are not a Christian. Christians is what they were called by the unbelievers. That's where the name came from, at Antioch, right, or in that region. They first called them Christians there. Now, look, you can call yourself Christian. We're Christians. So I got hung up on titles. But we aren't Christians because God called us Christians. No. We're Christians because the world calls us Christians. Yeah. Christian means followers of Christ. Now I want the world to know I am more than a follower of Christ. I am his brother and I am his family member and he is building his family. They can only see followers of him, but we are more than followers of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of you think you're Protestant. I'm not protesting anything. I have come to join everything to God. Amen. Amen. Stop protesting. Amen. I think the Bible talks. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. This is a table of equality. <laughs> I will decree the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, the builder of the family name. Today I have begotten you. Today I have begotten you. Today I have begotten you. It's all about God's choice, and he chose that salvation would come through him. This is why, and it's not arrogance. It is not arrogance. It is God's will. You cannot be saved by Krishna. You cannot be saved by Muhammad. You cannot be saved by Buddha. You cannot be saved by any other name than the name of the Son of the Most High God. That is the only way salvation can come. It's not, it's not prejudice. It's honor of God for what he declares, not what the nations rage against. The nations are raging against God's decrees and God's, God's declaration. But God is God. And who can challenge him? Will you contend with me? And that's what he says. He said to Job, he made it clear. So we think, well, who would contend with God? Well, <laughs> sometimes we do. <laughs> it's like as soon as you are aware of it, lay it down. Yeah. Lay it down. Yeah. Lay it down. Yeah. <laughs> Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. Imagine God going, you know, they're over there squawking. You who I've chosen. Son, ask of me. I'm God. I'm the one who straightened out Job. He's quiet now. He's got his hand on his mouth. <laughs> Do you know what it says in Ephesians and in Philippians? Every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven and earth. The only question is whether it's willingly. All right? Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. 
and the ends of the earth for your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. He's not talking about the people. He's talking about the spirit force that's behind the wickedness. He shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Mm -hmm. now, he's always tough on leaders. This is why I fear him so much. Because as a leader, I know I will give a greater account than you will. It says it in the Bible. So I don't despise that. I just think, all right, Chris. Make sure you're in order. So constantly check as a leader. Constantly check. If you're a king, check. Because sometimes as leaders and kings, you're, you're glancing to others for approval. And sometimes if you glance, you lose. Just obey God. Uh, he says, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Mm. Jesus. Mm. Jesus. Mm. Jesus. As they try to drive you out of the public square, we kiss you all the more. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. 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 Unashamedly. Unashamedly. It is Christ who brings religious freedom. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and perish, you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Can you say amen? amen. All right, Acts chapter 4, please. I want you to know that when he said, why do the nations rage, then it goes on in the scriptures to show where the nations raged. Now, this is something that can perpetually happen. It's something that did happen, and it's something that happened when it was said, all through time. It was something that, was, uh, that happened during the, writing, uh, during the time Jesus was on the earth and the disciples. Uh, it happened then, and they've recorded it, and then it's still happening. So um, the ultimate end of it all is that all things shall be subdued under the feet of Jesus Christ. And he's not using weapons. He's using the transformed heart. That's how he does it. His grace is sufficient to transform all hearts. Isn't that wonderful? So he says uh, in Acts chapter 4, I think we'll pick it up in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. That's boldness. That's boldness. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men can be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Mm -hmm, there's hope for you. There's hope for us. Ignorant, unlearned people, when the anointing comes on you, you can become clear and a spokesman from heaven. This is equality at the table of the Lord because his spirit comes upon you and elevates you to the God kind of life. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the words believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes, as well as Annas, uh, uh, the high priest, uh, uh, and Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as, as were uh, of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with 
the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged, oh gosh, what have I do? I jumped over. Bah, bah, bah. And verse 14, I'm sorry. And seeing that men who had been healed standing with them could, not, uh, could say nothing against it, but when they had co- commanded them to go out, uh, aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to those men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we, we cannot deny it. But so that it spread no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. See, this is the key. God chose his son. That might sound offensive to our world. God is God. He chose his son. God is not excluding people. He's saying, if you want to be included, I've chosen my son. Son, salvation is through him. Can you say amen? Amen. Salvation is through him. And he says uh, about this notable miracle, and then verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in that name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. Wow. Wow. Now, this is the clash. And this is the war even in our society. Let me tell you something. Christ is merciful, but Christ is a warrior. This is a dichotomy of the kingdom of God. Uh, Because a lot of people, sometimes I hear them talking on TV and stuff about Jesus. Jesus was nice and kind and fed the poor. Yeah, and ruthless to the rulers who disobeyed. Come on, tell the truth. Jesus is the one that said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He is also the one that said, I came to bring peace. (laughs) So I want you to know, when it comes to mankind before God, he came to bring peace. Now, those who don't receive peace, he came to bring a sword. And this is the dichotomy. And this is what people have a tough time accepting. God is not laying down his rulership for those who will not receive his peace. He's still the ruler. He's still God. He's still in charge. He prevails. He's never lost a fight yet. He has never lost. He never will. He's God. And I think humility allows us to say what Peter said. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more then to God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have heard and seen. Wow. Isn't that amazing? We cannot but speak. I want you to jump down <clears throat> verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord. Now, I I think it's important for us as a church to realize unity in purpose is essential. It's essential. Now, one thing I don't prefer is unity uh, by persecution. I don't prefer it. You will always notice, even in wars in the world, that a little nation gets attacked And they're all splintered, and they can't even run their own affairs. Yet suddenly, they are united against their enemies, their common enemies. There's power in unity, even if it's forced upon you. Let us not be forced. I say let us unify. So what does that mean, unify? That means get rid of your complaint. Yeah, see, we always have to leave our complaint at the door. Out there. I'll put a box out there or something. It's right in the box. And then we'll all lay hands on it. We won't even look at it. We'll just say, Father, thank you for healing us of whatever problems are in this box. Yes. And then we move on yes. together. You know, you know what I'm saying? Don't let little problems interfere with Almighty God's rulership over you. Yes. 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 Say, Pastor Chris, is this a Christmas message? Yes. Yes. Like you've never heard. <laughs> uh, God on Christmas morn, invaded the planet with his chief ruler, 
who is both merciful and just. He brought mercy to all. And in his hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But in his other hand is a sword. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. This is critical. This is kiss the sun. This isn't made up Christian stuff. No. This is Bible stuff. So he says, kiss the sun. So, so verse 24, so when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, whom by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Now they're quoting Psalm chapter 2. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined beforehand to be done. So I want you to know, he did not put evil and de destruction in them to kill Christ. He took the corruption and the evil that was in them in the hardness and used it to liberate the people. Because by killing Christ, they were setting free all the people who would believe in him because the price for sin was paid. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, I want some earthquakes around here. Yes. Not because of persecution, but because of unity. Yes. Those early Christians faced amazing opposition. They paid a price we cannot pay so that we could have a freedom that they couldn't even imagine. But we have it not for luxury and fatness, but for pursuit and freedom to pursue God and his will and his purposes. Come on, somebody. Come on, break out of that sluggishness. Awake, O oh sleeper. You are not in this great nation with freedom so that you can fatten yourself. Eat good, too. But we, we, we receive freedom by the death of brothers. People have fallen in the good cause to bring liberty to light. Christ came to shatter the powers that be, to break open a new way, and that way has come. The church was also called the way. They were called the way before they were called Christians. Imagine that, the way. What church are you part of? The way. <laughs> no, don't say that because there was a way church. <laughs> I don't think you want to be a member. <laughs> Do you understand that? God has introduced his eternal purpose through Christ, and that's what we're celebrating. We are the celebrators of the kingdom of God and of his Christ. There's a way, one way. You like that song, one way, Jesus, you know? And there is, there's one way. There's a reason that Jesus is the only way. It's not because his name is Jesus. It's actually Yeshua. And he wasn't a white guy. He was colorful. Amen. You know, we got all these vain ideas that got to go. The reason salvation is in Christ Jesus is because he was born of man and born of God. He is the first of his kind who ever existed. He's not just some great leader who accomplished something great. It's what he is that makes him great, not what he does. 
It's what he is. He is humanity and God joined together to produce one new man called Jesus the Christ. At the right hand of the Father, there's a man seated at the right hand of the Father. The man, Christ Jesus. Uh Uh-huh. So we know he's the son of God. Everybody knows he's the son of God. People, well, people don't believe it sometimes, but he was the son of God. That's the most proclaimed thing about Jesus. We don't have a problem proclaiming him as the son of God. When he came to the earth, they had a hard time proclaiming him as son of God. They only knew him as son of man. Now the problem has reversed. Now everybody believes he's the son of God, but he's not the son of man. It's weird. It's all changed. And I think... The thing that's got to happen is we can't pendulum back over to Son of Man. we got to stay in the center where the truth is. He is the Son of Man, and he is the Son of God. He's the offspring of mankind, and he's the offspring of God. It takes two to tango, baby. God's salvation to the earth is the miraculous union of himself with man. He says, this is how I'll save the planet. I'll join myself to humanity. And humanity and I together will save the world. It is an amazing, amazing thing when you think about it. You can read in Matthew chapter 1 how it says, um, how the angel spoke to Joseph and he said to him, he says, take Mary to be your wife. Because Joseph was going to was going to break the engagement off and, and file papers to get rid of her because they had already signed papers to be joined in those days, how they did it, because she was already betrothed to him in marriage, yet they weren't not together. Uh, they hadn't yet had a full consummation of marriage. And uh, he was going to get rid of her. And the angel appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Joseph, take Mary as your wife. But I don't like her. <laughs> no, it's... You know what I'm saying? He, yeah. Think about what God said to him through this angel. Take Mary for the child which is in her. Right. See, now he's, oh, my gosh. Not only did I find out, but now an angel's telling me she's pregnant too. Yeah. <laughs> Little tramp. Yeah. He was mad. He, but because it says because he was a just man, he was going to do it privately. He didn't want to mock her or make a, a bad scene. Now, he knew she'd be stoned because in those days, if you did that, you were stoned to death. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. So he says, take her. That which is in her is conceived of the sacred spirit of God. Uh (laughs) Joseph was like, what? (laughs) How did that happen? Now, we're not telling you that part. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> what matters is he was made. <laughs> so the angel said, for, an a- uh, for the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And conceived in her is a son. Ask of me, son, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. And you know, just to make it fair, it's kind of like Zeus, you know, these movies. It's so, so stupid, you know, they have all these gods. But some of the things they do are funny in these movies, you know. I kind of like them. I think they're funny. I like the Kraken. (laughs) But God, can you imagine God? Think about what he's like. Let's see. My son's going to be born. Let's get a royal procession. Let's get some Cadillac camel-ish stuff. Let's roll out the trumpets and the band, and let's gather the nation and have a big celebration at the triumphal entry of the son, the ruler of the whole world. Now, let's put him in a feed trough. And let's make sure there's no room at the inn. Let's make him a servant, not of himself, but of everybody. 
and he can take all their sins on him, my precious son, and I'll have him killed by those scoundrels who are trying to cast off my rule. Yeah, that's how I'll do it. Because we don't think like God. He has to put them at disadvantage to prove the great advantage is not how you're born, where you're born, or who's your mom and dad, or whether you're missing a father in action. But the fact that the spirit of the living God abides inside of you, and he came up from that low place to become the ruler over all the heavens and all the earth. Yep, right. yep, true. And he says, I hold the keys of death and of hell in my hand. This is God's plan of salvation. <laughs> I love John chapter 6 and verse 37. Oh, man, that is a great scripture. Jesus said some great words. I've been now confessing them. He says, all Things that the Father has for me, all these things, all this that the Father has for me will come to me. That's pretty strong faith. All that the Father has for me will come to me. That's confidence. And he says, and I will by no means turn away any disciple who comes to me. So quit squirming about who your disciples are. Just start confessing. All the Father has for me, all my disciples, all the ones I'm supposed to nurture and care for, all the ones I'm going to transfer this kingdom to, they will come to me. Yeah, you need to start saying that over your life because you are of the same seed he's of. And so Jesus knew that the Father, he even said, he says, why do you quibble? There in John 6, you read it. And the, they started quibbling about this and that and the Pharisees and they were talking. And he says, why are you quibbling? No man can come to me unless the Father draws him. You by no means can come to me unless he grants you. Wow. Not only will they all come, but he'll stop everyone that's not going to yield to God. So don't be stopped. Say, well, how do I not be stopped? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Amen. That is the key. Amen. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry little Christmas. You'll tide. Right, Margie says he always gets it wrong. He always. <laughs> I always, I always love the songs that say stuff like humble and meek, meek and mild Jesus, the little soft white guy. <laughs> he was a stinking carpenter. Look, in those days, if your dad was a carpenter, you were one. You didn't have an option. You say, son, help me out. And you get in there and you work. He was a rugged person. He didn't have a white collar. Isn't it amazing? The blue collared guy saved the white collared guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Mm, that's something you should think about. You live in their houses, you eat the food they grow. We should never take pride in what we have except that it comes from the Almighty. Amen. True prosperity is what God gives you. Isaiah 9. I'll finish here. Isaiah 9, 6. And this is a fulfillment of Psalms chapter 2. For unto us a child is born. Isn't it amazing? God says, I have an answer, a solution for sin. I'll send a child. It's really an amazing thing, you know. You say, well, I pray for my kids, but, you know, they're going to make their own choices in life. I can't control their destiny. 
I'm telling you what, what you pray and prophesy yeah. over their lives will control them every day of their life. Yeah. Don't give me any of that rubbish. And don't say it's control. It's not the wrong kind of control. It's the guidance of heaven to bring them to their predetermined purpose. Stop looking at their offenses and start looking at the prophetic mantle upon your life to declare the work of the Lord over your household. Yeah. Begin to say what the Lord says and the nations will come to your light. Yes. Amen. And your child. I agree. The Bible addresses everything. For unto us a child is born. Somebody tell me. You don't have to answer. But somebody tell me. What is this child? It's a God man. This child, which is going to rule all things, is God's representative forever. And he is man. And he is God. Conceived in her is of the Holy One. Conception is the merger of two precious things. All your children are the mother and the father, 100% mom, 100% dad. That's right. You look at the genetics and you look up the makeup. It's 100% mom and 100% dad. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. That means Jesus was 100% us and 100% God. And he walked around the earth. And you know what God in union with man does? Heals people. Casts demons out. Corrects their logic patterns about what's true in God's world. And overthrows Rulers and leaders who despise the purpose of God and introduces life and liberty to all who will hear him. And ultimately, he will cause, through his church, whom he's handed the keys of this kingdom to, he will cause the whole world to become liberated through him. It's an ever-increasing purpose. Now listen to what he says, because these are original prophetic words about Christ. They cannot be annulled. They cannot be taken away. If you're still on on board with the end times, I ask you to go to our YouTube channel. Go there and get part one and part two of our end of the age series. So you learn about it. So you don't think it's the end of our age. It's the end of their age. Back the Old Testament age ended. In verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given a builder of the family name, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name, now name means, it's the word, the the, the word name uh, represents nature. Whenever you say the name of something, like blindness, it's a name. It's talking about the nature you can't see. So the nature, his nature will be called wonderful. His name, his nature will be called wonderful, counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase, of the increase. Can you say of the increase? increase. Of his government and peace. peace. There will be no end. end. So much for all those theories. (laughs) See, if we just believe the base prophetic words, it would guide your thoughts about end time stuff. Because there will be no reduction of the church age. The, the age that we are in is ordered by the Lord. Of the uh, increase of his government and peace, there be no upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, and to in order to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. For the zeal of the church, the zeal of man, the conditions of the earth will produce it. No. It says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. He is not putting the determination of this, whether it happens or not, in the hands of any man. But he has given the keys of authority to his church. And if his church fails or parts of his church fail, he keeps building his church. He is always, he told me one time, he says, because I was praying for some church and it was all religious and, and weird and it was hurting people. And I was like, oh God, if they could just, and I was praying for them. And he said to me, I'm not reforming churches. I'm building mine. I was like, wow. it was such a shock to me. Wow. I thought I was being kind and gracious, praying for them. He says, get busy building my, my church. Stop lamenting over that which is not in my kingdom. I was like, Okay. So I, I stopped the wasting of time praying for that which is already against them. 
build. Jesus is the builder of the family name. So don't get confused. Sometimes churches are weak and they need your prayers. But others are contrary to the root. Don't waste time. Build his church. Amen. Have yourself some merry little Christmas. Do you know why you give presents to people? Because it's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of giving. We got to give. Stop thinking about what you're going to get. What are you getting me? No, I mean, stop, stop, thinking, stop thinking about what you're going to get. Think about what you can give. And maybe take this little admonition. If you complain about shopping, it diminishes your present. It does. I hated it. It was terrible out there. Here. <laughs> Next year, we're going on a cruise. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can you stand? (laughs) Father, all.